So as we get started today, I want to invite you, if you brought your Bible with you, to lift it up so we can see it. We should be proud of our Bibles. I'm proud of my Bible. And I'm going to say the Word of God for the people of God, and then you say thanks be to God. You ready? The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word, and Lord, I, um, I just want to ask you to bless the words I would say that would help us encounter your word. And Lord, we ask that your word would speak into our lives on this morning, and God, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to be looking uh, beginning today at Matthew 7, but we're in, on the second week of our series called Twisted, and the idea behind it is that there are certain passages of Scripture that get twisted in our culture, and they, they don't get used absolutely the wrong way. Sometimes they just get used halfway, or we tend to misuse them in, in different contexts where the meaning of the Scripture is not fully exposed to us. And... Um, Last time we looked at a scripture that dealt with prayer, and this time we're going to deal with one that's, that's pretty important. It deals with judging other people. Do you, do you think that's a relevant uh, topic in our world today? Well, a lot of times people quote a certain scripture that comes from Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. I'll share it with you and uh, follow along with me in your in Bible. Mine's uh, the New Living Translation. It says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Have you ever heard that verse before? In what context have you heard that verse before? Uh, You know, as I think about how we use that verse... Now, I'm not a fan of Jerry Springer. I just, I just want to say that up front. But every time I've seen snippets of Jerry Springer, I think somebody on the show has used that verse and said, you know, the Bible says you can't judge me, you know. Um, it, 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 it never comes out like a preacher would read it, you know. There's some emotion and, and emphasis behind it. And the idea behind that is, You can't really tell me how to live. You know, um, you, you especially, don't have the right to point out my mistakes or faults or sins. You have no right to highlight what could be harmful or unhealthy for me. Now, that's half true, right? That's half true. Uh, the, the vibe there is, and it's one of the dominant values in our culture now, is just live and let live, bro. Dude, my name's Cody. Um, it, sorry, Cody, I love you. Um, it doesn't matter what I do so long as it makes me happy and so long as it doesn't hurt you. It's one of the dominant values in our culture, and sometimes because of that, we think that it's also a biblical value, and it's half true. Hear me say that. It's half true, because judgment is hard. Judgment's not an easy thing, is it? Nobody likes to be judged, do they? Do you like to be judged? I don't like to be judged. As a child, the one time where I just sobbed at school was when a teacher accused me of cheating, and I didn't. I mean, I was unconsolable. I was like, what? She actually said, do you need to go to the restroom? And I was like, yes. And I went to the restroom. I was like, what? I didn't cheat. And uh, my mom actually had to come pick me up. I was inconsolable. I had been judged harshly and wrongly. Our... uh, amazing worship leader, Macy Preston, that would be Cody's wife, had an experience recently where she took her little son, Graham, out to eat lunch, and she forgot to put her wedding ring on that day, and uh, Graham was acting up a little bit at lunch, and, and Cody wasn't around, and before lunch ended, a man walks up to Macy, not knowing her name, not knowing her life, not knowing her situation, not knowing that she's a worship leader at Hope Church, and he says, you know, 
If your child had a strong male figure, he might not act that way. That feel good, Macy? No, that didn't feel good. Well, judging feels bad. And our world craves a place where we're not judged and we're lifted up. So much so that this idea of not judging has become one of our dominant cultural values and so much so that I want to show you a video in just a second, but have you ever heard of Bonnaroo? You may have heard of Bonnaroo. Yeah, a couple of folks. Bonnaroo is a music festival up in uh, uh, Manchester, Tennessee, sort of between Chattanooga and Nashville. One year they drew over 100,000 people. I think they've actually cut off the limit a little lower at about 80,000 people. They charged $359 a ticket to go to a multiple day music festival. Guys, let me tell you how much money the Bonnaroo folks are messing with. That's over $30 million, okay? And I'm going to show you their 2019 promo video because there's not a single band in it. I want to show you what is attracting folks to Bonnaroo. Let's watch this together. Bonnaroo is happiness. Bonnaroo is home. What brings me back is the culture. People come together to radiate positivity. You come here, you could be from anywhere, and people will accept you and say hello and just treat you like a fellow human being and neighbor. Happy Roo! Happy Roo! As soon as like, I'm talking to people, they're like, happy Roo, giving fist bumps, giving high fives. There is this beauty of acceptance that I had never felt before. Whatever you do, whatever you want, everybody here, they want you to be you. And I've never felt more comfortable than I am at Roo. It's hands down different than every other festival. The pure happiness and love is unbelievable. We started out as strangers and this is one of the closest families I've ever had. As soon as I wake up, I just look to my side, people are smiling, you know what I'm saying? That's like literally the best feeling ever. There's literally not one negative vibe. If you want a place that you can experience this kind of love and affection for people and music and just complete positivity, this is where you need to be and this is where you should be. Honor is the place that I didn't know that I needed. And I can't miss this now because I don't want to miss these people. You know, sometimes we, uh, we talk about those mega churches and how they're all about money, but I don't know many churches with a $600,000 a Sunday budget. That's what that would equal if you were to put it all together. Well, this verse from Jesus is true. And part of what we need to say before we move forward is that um, this idea that somehow Christians are more judgmental than loving is probably one of the biggest reasons that non-Christians would stay away from church or from the body of Christ. And so it's a real issue in our world at the same time as believers in Christ, we're called to guide folks toward what would be godly and helpful and holy and pleasing to God. And so when Jesus says these words, he, he has a deeper meaning than just don't judge. Because um, open affirmation of everything and every behavior is not healthy for the world, is it? It's not good. God is more loving than that. And because God is loving, God is also a God of justice. And the two things go together and we can't separate them. When we started this series, we said as we look at the Bible and as we untwist these verses, we use a couple of tools. One of the tools that we'll use is to understand the context clues 
a little bit, as much as we can. Now, uh, there are people with PhDs degree called scholars who go way deep in the context. But we'll brush the surface of context because it's absolutely necessary in understanding what the Bible actually says. The second thing we said is that we'll use other scriptures. You see, one scripture sheds light on the other scripture and helps us understand the one that we're trying to understand here. Lastly, we'll apply what we learn. The Bible is not a book just to be uh, willed as, as I know something that you don't. It is something that adjusts, changes, guides, challenges, encourages everything we do. And so we'll try to apply what we learn to our own heart and our own life. So let's get started with context. Matthew 7 is where this verse about not judging comes from. And I just want to ask you, uh, context 101, what comes before Matthew 7? Matthew 6. You guys are on it. Uh, Matthew 6. And, and in Matthew 6, the big theme that's being talked about, and there's lots of red letters in both these chapters, by the way. So Jesus is talking, and in Matthew 6, the big theme is hypocrisy. In fact, in particular, in Matthew 6, 2, 5, and 16, it's hypocrisy related to giving, to praying, and to fasting, and how we don't do these things for a show. And then after talking about hypocrisy, Jesus goes directly into, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. But then later on, in, verse, in chapter 7, Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. Be aware of false teachers. Now, what's required to be aware of a false teacher? Judging. I know we don't like that word, and our judging is required to be aware. Let's use a softer word, okay? Discernment is required to be. So right there, was Jesus a hypocrite? Did, did, did Jesus have a early onset dementia and not remember what he was talking about? Or do these two things go together? Do not judge, watch out for false teachers. Don't be a hypocrite, do not judge. Do these things, I think they go together. You see, Jesus is not telling us to live without discernment. What he's telling us is that we shouldn't let discernment quickly jump over into unjustified, self-centered judgment. And that we have to be very, very, very careful when we make judgment calls. Remember, the theme is actually hypocrisy, not judgment. More context. Consider what comes right after the verses I read. And if your Bible's open, you may have already looked at it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Verses 3, 4, and 5 are a very familiar passage. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite, it says. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So here's the deal. I am called to discern good and bad, right and wrong, healthy, unhealthy, godly, ungodly, holy, unholy in this world. I am called to discern the difference. But I better be really, really, really careful when I think of others. And I better look at myself first. You see, um, other scriptures tell us a little bit about this judging thing. Jesus says, don't be judged or you'll be judged by that same standard. And we need to be careful with it. How are we supposed to be careful? 
If we open up some other scriptures and we, we turn over to, to John chapter 7, verse 24, for example, um, it tells us to never judge superficially. And we like to do that, don't we? I, I, I have a, a sin in my own life. And I'll just call it what it is. It's a sin. And thankfully, I've lost this habit for the most part. But there was a time where I really had to challenge myself to stop it. Because I would be out in public somewhere and I would see someone who maybe was dressed a certain way or doing a certain thing. I didn't know this person's name. I just saw him from a distance. And two words would pop in my head. The first one started with D. And the second one started with A. Do you know what they were? I was absolutely judging superficially. And don't judge me. You do it too. <laughs> right? You're just judging me, weren't you? You were judging me. You know, okay. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. But in John 7, 24, it says, look beneath the surface. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. It doesn't say, what? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly correctly. So we don't judge on appearance. We can never judge correctly on appearance. Profiling doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Maybe it works in other places, but it doesn't work in the kingdom of God. I can't look at someone and know their life and their heart. The tan-skinned guy with a thick accent may or may not be a terrorist. Sorry. The young black man with a hoodie may or may not be a criminal. The young white man in a flannel shirt and a pickup truck all jacked up may or may not be a racist. We can't judge by appearances, can we? The Bible makes that clear. And let me say this. Churches can be guilty of profiling people as well. And do you know how churches can fall into the trap of profiling people? Well, that person may or may not be a good member. But our job is not to find good members, is it? Our job is not to find folks who can contribute to our success, is it? Our job as a church is to shine the light of Jesus Christ for all people who need to know the love and grace and wisdom of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't come with a lens that says, would this person be a good church member? That comes with a lens that says, is the kingdom of God progressing in this place and in this relationship? Amen. Amen. I like it. You see, we're called... To discern. And in some ways we're called to judge. But we got to look beneath the surface when we do that. And we got to be careful. And we start by looking at ourselves. And if we feel the need to speak into somebody else's life, we better look below the surface. Secondly, from Scripture, never judge hypocritically. Never judge hypocritically. If we turn over to, to Romans chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we find out about judging hypocritically. It says, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. <laughs> This is a great way to attract people to God, right? I mean, Paul, you know, the greatest missionary there's ever been. Um, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you are judging others. You who are judging others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. 
Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? People. But you know what I found true about Scripture? It enters into that spot, but it never stops at that spot. Because ultimately, God is a God of redemption. God is a God of love. God is a God of lifting us up. So you want to know what the very next verse says? Romans chapter 2 verse 4. I love this verse. It says, don't you see how wonderful, wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. What turns us from our sin? Idiot. <laughs> Does that turn us from our sin? Never, ever, not once in human history has that turned us. It says that God's kindness and mercy and gentleness ultimately turns us from our sin. These are hard words and they're such life-giving words. You're just as bad. You're condemning yourself. And then Romans 2, 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is? You see, we're not just talking about a, a balance of truth and grace here. Grace leads and truth follows. The truth is rarely heard without grace. Acceptance is not affirmation. Acceptance is just love. That's important. Acceptance doesn't mean affirmation. Acceptance is just love. Third place in scripture. We got to remember if we're going to pull out our judgment hat or discerning hat. Never hold non-Christians to Christian standards. Do you know where we're supposed to judge? Inside the church. What? Somewhere along the way we got that flipped. We like to get together and we like to judge everybody outside the church. But we're supposed to do is love outside the church and judge inside the church. We're supposed to call each other out when we're misbehaving and we're supposed to call each other toward God's very best and guess what we're supposed to do it in loving ways and we can never do it without looking at our own eye first see how much deeper that is then don't you judge me right see how much life giving that is scripture has a way of speaking into life in a way that conventional or common wisdom doesn't. 1 Corinthians 5.12 tells us it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Wow. That's a hard place. I, I had a, an opportunity to uh, be with a guy named Miles Welch. He's the a central campus pastor for 12 Stone Church, one of the great stories of church growth in Atlanta. And you may not have heard of it because it's mostly on the east side of Atlanta, but there's just thousands of people over the last 30 years who have become part of 12 Stone and they have six or seven campuses. I said, Miles, what's one of the keys? And everybody wants to talk to a pastor. How do you grow, man? How do you grow? Or, you know, how do you reach people? And he said, one of the keys to who we are, he said, he used this phrase, aggressive discipleship conversations. Well, what do you mean by that? He says, we talk to church people about what it means to be holy. We talk to church people about what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And we have environments where we intentionally lift each other up to a higher place and hold each other accountable. I get that. I get that. I really do. 
But in the sense of that, we never hold non-Christians to Christian standards. And one of the biggest barriers at the front door of the church is that we don't allow people time to belong to make a decision for Christ before we would start having aggressive discipleship conversations. There's an order. Because we all need Jesus. And we're all not at the same place, are we? We all need to be loved. We all need to be encouraged. In a sense, y'all, we all need to go to Bonnaroo. But we need a Bonnaroo that points beyond just affirmation. We need a Bonnaroo that points to the goodness and the graciousness and the love and the mercy and the way of God and the way of Jesus Christ. We play a couple of games at church, and then I'll share the last thing. But we play a couple of games. We, we play this game a lot at church. We, um, we, we, like to, uh, we like to talk about how those people make bad decisions and about how our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. And can you believe it? Can you believe this world we live in? You know, as I look around, it feels like Jesus is coming back soon. The world's falling apart. And we like to, to play that game at church. But I want to tell you, have you ever read the Old or the New Testament and seen the cultures that the writers of both of those testaments are talking into? They're not that much different than the time we live in now. I mean, the expansion of the early church happened in an age where Paul literally had to tell the people in the church, don't have sex with your relatives. It's right there in the New Testament. I mean, it's just not that much different. And so what we like to do is we like to look outside of the church and say, everything's happening horrible out there. But the right question isn't what's happening out there and we missed one letter A. You've probably already found it. The, the right question isn't what's happening out there. The right question is, are we being like God? That's the right question. Am I being like God? Is our church being like God? Are you being like God? Am I pursuing Christ's likeness in my life? Because ultimately, that's what will change the world. All the complaining and whining about the end times and when Jesus is coming back is not going to change the world. Sorry. Never has, never will. Here's another game we like to play and it's sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum. I've heard this phrase around hope and I think I know what it means. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But it can be a bad thing. Did you know this is a judgment-free zone? Man, it's a... It's a it's a judgment-free zone. And I think what that means is we accept you for who you are. And if that's what it means, it's a good thing because that is what we want to do and be. I mean, thank you for accepting me today in my yellow shirt, right? We accept you for who you are, for, for where you've come from, for the stuff you've put up with in life, for the perspectives you have about God and culture and politics, for the way you choose to dress, for, for all that. We accept you for who you are. And if that means acceptance, it's a good thing. But if that means there are no judgments, if that means whatever goes, if that means there is no holy standard, if that means that God is never offended by anything and there is no sin in the world, if that means that Jesus didn't have to die on the cross to forgive our sins, to make us free from our sin that destroys us and that destroys our families and destroys our life and ultimately destroys our world, then that is not a good thing because sin does exactly that. And if we're not going to call each other away from sin and toward God's goodness and holiness, then it's not a judgment-free zone. It's actually a judgment zone because we're helping each other take a slow march toward hell. Are you with me? That was a little strong, wasn't it? So are we pointing each other towards God's goodness or towards more selfishness? You see, let's be a church where people can belong before they believe. But let's never give up on the idea that when we believe, the power of God sets us free from the power of sin and death. There's a balance there.
Lastly, lastly, the Bible tells us always help restore fallen believers. Galatians 6, 1 through 2. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. You know why this is so important? Because we're all going to need it at one time or another. I mean, you know, except Emmanuel, of course. He's perfect. I've seen if you're listening to Emmanuel. We're all going to need it at one time or another. See, we tend to focus on the big stuff. Like when we say restoration, you know, some guy really fell from grace and we're trying to restore him. And that does happen. And I have a friend in ministry I'm so disappointed in. Because he had an ongoing affair with a woman who wasn't his wife. And he needed to step down from his role as pastor. And he did. His credentials were turned in. He stepped away from his role. He entered into a season of what? Shooting him? Beating him with a bat? Beating the sin out? He entered into a season of, of kicking him out? He entered into a season of his pastor friends never talking to him again? He entered into a season? No, he entered into a season of restoration. Now, he had to want it. I mean, you can't just be restored if you're arrogant. You sort of stay in that. But he had to want it. He had to humbly say, I, I was, and guys, 10 years later, he'll look at me and say, I'm sorry I did that thing. And in the midst of that restoration, restoration He's never sort of returned to that place where he was. And don't get me wrong. And King David didn't either, by the way. Some people say, well, King David's sin. Oh, King David's life fell apart after that. I mean, God still used him. God still blessed him. But it was never the same. And this guy's life has never been the same. I don't mean to say that. But he has been used by God in ministry. He started a ministry called Rattle. The Restoration Atlanta that reaches out to homeless people in downtown Atlanta. He's now part of the Wesleyan Church and is leading a small and growing church. His son has joined him in ministry and he's leading a service on Sunday night. And they've grown by about 50% in the last couple of years. Ten years later. And being still transparent and open about the sin that he committed because he will always be accountable for it. But folks, we always help restore fallen believers. In less dramatic ways, we each need restoration. Because we're all fallen in some place in our life. And if we're not... If we don't know a place where we need God's mercy and grace, then we're just numb to the Spirit of God. And I would invite you to open yourself up and say, God, search me and know me. Let's close things out. John 1.14 tells us that Jesus came full of two things, grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Do you know what it doesn't say? Truth and grace. A lot of truth and a little bit of grace. Nothing but the truth and no grace. It says grace and truth. As though they are co-equal things. But we all know that we argue over whether it's the Auburn-Alabama game or the Alabama-Auburn game. Because it matters which word comes first, right? Right? So the Bible in this case leads with grace. There's a reason that both are included, but there's also a reason that grace would come first. Where there is truth and no grace, that leads to rebellion. Don't you know the truth? That leads to rebellion. 
but where there is grace and no truth. Do you know what that leads to? Do whatever you want. That also leads to rebellion. It's when we lead with grace and join the two together that we lead to the place of God's calling. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could keep on sinning. But he also didn't die on the cross with lack of compassion so that he could accuse us and beat us down for our sins. Jesus died on the cross so that because of his grace, we could be lifted up beyond the truth of what sin does to us and be lifted up to a different place. So let me speak to you and then let me speak to your friends. First of all, you. We can't affirm everything you're doing. We accept you. We love you. We want God's best for you. But if we really knew you, we can't affirm everything you're doing. You might need to repent of your sin. It, but as you do that, don't lean into judgment as much as you lean into the love and mercy and grace of God. You see, God's already decided that he loves you. You can't earn that. You can't win its favor. The verdict is in. What God is waiting on is for you to recognize that he loves you and then to live your life as a response to that love. And sometimes that response, a loving response, is, I'm sorry, God. Now let me speak about our friends. We accept everyone. But we don't affirm everything. And that's not easy. Especially in a world where Bonnery can rake in over $30 million for the experience of being accepted and affirmed for four days. We accept you, but we don't affirm everything. And if there's somebody in your life that you feel like you need to have a conversation with, then there probably is. Somebody in your family, somebody at work, somebody somewhere. Do a couple of things. They're the things we've looked at today. Look beyond the superficial. Try to understand the heart. Don't be a hypocrite. You better check yourself before you have that conversation. <laughs> know the difference between a believer and an unbeliever and treat them differently. Right? Belong before believe, but once we've believed, we are called to a higher standard. Look for the best in that person. Shower them with grace, with kind and encouraging word. Find the parts of them that are good and noble and honorable and holy and even godly and point out those things. Pray for them. Don't pray that God will fix them. Pray for them. Pray genuinely that they will know God's goodness and God's best. And when you do have that conversation, man, be as humble and gentle as you can think of being. And let them know that you're in the same place they are. That you 
are a sinner in need of God's mercy and grace and that you're thankful for all of the blessings of God's life. You're thankful for the way of Jesus and the only reason you're talking is because you want the same thing for them. So, before we sing our last song, and before anybody who brought some Cokes gathers up, we head out to share God's love. I want to invite you to either pray for yourself or pray for somebody else. It's pretty much that simple.